Will you pray with me? Oh, Father, thank you for being able to um, concentrate so many of our thoughts um, through these words on the birth of your son. Lord, we want um, to understand more and more over the next week what it means that God became flesh. And in understanding more, Lord, we want our affections for the Savior, Jesus, stirred up within our hearts. Would you please meet with us now as we open your word, and would you speak to us through your word, and would we, that you might humble us, Father, that we would sit under your word joyfully and eagerly, so that you might conform us more into the image of your precious Son. We draw near to you now, asking for your help. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Please take your Bibles and let's open them up to Hebrews chapter 2 this morning. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. This week and obviously next, we'll be spending a little bit of time focusing on the incarnation, God taking on flesh. And these are the kinds of words we are singing. Words like this, think on this, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Do you see the second member of the Godhead veiled in flesh? Hail the incarnate deity. Greet exuberantly the enfleshed God. Words like this we sing, pleased as man with men to dwell. He was pleased to dwell with men as a man. Mild he lays his glory by. His glory is his weighty, impressive splendor. And humbly he laid it aside. And we sang this this morning, word of the Father now in flesh appearing. Oh, come, let us adore him. You see, that's the response to the incarnation. The songwriters thought of the incarnation of, of God adding human flesh to his deity in Jesus, and they thought of worship as they thought of that. The incarnation alone is, is amazing, and that's what we want to focus on, God robing himself in frail humanity. But we want that to be fuel for our worship of Jesus. So that's the purpose of this message this morning is, is to marvel at the incarnation and, and to worship Jesus. And the passage that will serve that end today, Lord willing, is Hebrews 2, 14 to 18. Let me read it to you. You can follow along. The writer says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood... He himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and so that he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For he assuredly does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. My intent this morning is that our look into this passage would be a devotional one, that it would stir our affections for the Savior, and we'll do this by focusing on three main characters in the passage, one at a time. First, we're going to see what these verses say about the children that are mentioned in this passage, and then we'll see what these verses say about the devil who is mentioned in this passage, and then lastly, we'll see what these verses say about the Son 
And in so doing, we'll find, Lord willing, the incarnation amazing, and we will put some more fuel on the fire of worship for Jesus. So let's start. What makes the incarnation so amazing? Uh, Number one, it's the children's fearful condition. What do these verses say about the children's fearful condition? They're mentioned in verse 14. Who are these children? Well, back up to verse 10. Verse 10 says that Jesus is bringing many sons to glory through his salvation for them through his death at the cross. That's who the children are. Who are they? Verse 11 says they are the ones who are sanctified. And verses 11 and 12 say they are the ones Jesus is not ashamed to call his brothers and sisters, his family. And verse 13 says they are the children that God has given to Christ. The children are those who have been saved by God through Messiah's suffering. They are the ones who believe Christ. And these believing children are in a condition in verse 14 called flesh and blood. And it says that the children share in that flesh and blood. It means that they have a very close fellowship relationship with flesh and blood. Now, when the word flesh stands alone in the New Testament, oftentimes it refers to our sinful weakness. But here it's paired with blood, flesh and blood. And it primarily means just humanity. But weak humanity. Weak humanity in contrast to God who is not flesh and blood, but who is spirit. God who is eternal, who knows no beginning and has no end. This flesh and blood mentioned here doesn't automatically immediately refer to something immoral or unethical in the children, although this passage will tell us that we are immoral and unethical. We sin. But at this point, it just is a reference to the children's humanity, frail humanity, and that's the condition that is imposed on these children, frail humanity. And notice what marks our condition of frail humanity in verse 15. The children are those who have a fear of death in that flesh and blood condition. Our flesh and blood is in particular susceptible to death because, as the Apostle Paul says, we we are mortal. We are perishable in flesh and blood, and we are corruptible in flesh and blood. And flesh and blood, therefore, likes to stay as far away from death as possible because death is what ends flesh and blood. When flesh and blood meet death, flesh always loses. And so flesh and blood fear the power that death has over it. We need to be freed Because we are the ones who, through fear of death, were subject to slavery all of our lives. Flesh and blood naturally fears that which can end it. And death and our fear of death enslaves us. These are the kind of children we are. Death owns us, and the fear of death owns us in our weakened flesh and blood condition. So flesh and blood is a a very weak condition and is powerless against death and the fear of death. It's powerless against the threat of death. The best that frail humans can do with the threat of death always pending is amuse themselves. Try to laugh at anything and anything else and just not think about death. What else does this passage say about the children? Well, what makes our flesh and blood condition most fearful is that we have sinned in that flesh and blood. Verse 17, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Sin in this flesh and blood condition is what gives death its power and sting. First Corinthians 15 verse 56, 
the sting of death is sin. You see, when flesh and blood with its indwelling sin meets death, sinners are ushered directly into God's courtroom and and they must face a holy God. Just turn a few pages to the right to Hebrews 9, verse 27. It is appointed for men to die once and after this judgment. Flesh and blood fears that moment. Flesh and blood stands no chance in that moment. What else does this passage say about the children? It gets worse. In a flesh and blood condition that's already marred by indwelling sin, we are, verse 18, temptable, and we are tempted. And we need somebody to come to our aid as ones who are tempted. We are tempted to do more sin that already has us in, under the power of death. And our frail humanity can't resist the temptation What a condition of weakness the children are in. Think on this. We are frail humanity to begin with. We're just mortal. We're we're perishable. We're corruptible. Add to that the fact that sin indwells us and mars that human frailty. And therefore, death is something we greatly fear because of the judgment that follows death. And then in that condition, day after day, in that frail condition, we're continually tempted to sin more and more and more. We're in a condition in which we need help. Verse 16, he gives help. We're in a condition in which we need someone to come to our aid. Verse 18, He is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So what is amazing about the incarnation is that the word became this flesh and blood. This this condition of weakness. He robed himself in this frail humanity, yet without the sin of it. That the second member of the Godhead would step into what for you and I is a fearful condition is amazing. What a huge leap God made toward us. We couldn't even make a pathetic hop towards him in that condition. We're weak, we're frail, we are unable to free ourselves from the fear of death that enslaves us, but but God is all-powerful. He's eternal, he's without beginning and end, and he was willing to add to himself this weakness of flesh and blood and to do it for you, to do it for me. And that's what makes the incarnation so amazing, the children's fearful condition. Secondly, what makes the incarnation so amazing is the devil's powerful domination. The devil's powerful domination Let's consider what this passage says about the devil. The devil's mentioned in verse 14. Let me read it for you. Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he, Jesus, might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. You see, he's described as the one having the power of death. And what does he do with that power of death? He enslaves those in a flesh and blood condition who fear that death. Verse 15, we are the ones who are subject to slavery all our lives through fear of death. Your flesh and blood condition is marred by sin. And then this one, with the power of death, he tries to tempt you to even more sin. Verse 18, And then he holds death over you and the judgment to come and he terrifies you with it day after day after day. He knows just how to aggravate your weakness and he knows just how to capitalize on your vulnerable condition. Listen, he's the first terrorist 
and he's the worst. In our weak flesh and blood condition, we're, we're like a gazelle being hunted down by a hungry lion who's prowling after us. He is a wicked and a merciless being. And he delivers usually no quick, decisive blow of death, but rather he pursues us for a long time, a lifetime. He drags out the chase as long as he can, and our slavery to fear of death is maximized against our weak flesh and blood condition. Hey, what, what, what can we do? What can our flesh and blood condition do against such a foe like this? We are doomed if someone doesn't act. And that is exactly what God did, and that is what makes the incarnation so amazing. But I want you to think for a moment carefully about how he did not do it. And I'll do it by giving you perhaps a simple, small, maybe even silly illustration. I want you to imagine you're looking down into a cage of sorts, and in it, you see a small little mouse. And as you watch the mouse, you notice that it's very anxious. It's very nervous. It's very concerned. That's because over on the other side of the cage is a boa constrictor slowly making its way over to the mouse, and the mouse knows it. And you know, as you look down upon this, that it's all over. It's just a matter of time. And in your heart, you are provoked to mercy for that mouse. And as a man larger, more powerful than that snake, you don't like what you see happening. So how would you rescue the mouse? Well, in your superior power to the snake and over the mouse, you would do one of two things. You'd either take the snake out and rescue the mouse, or you would snatch the mouse out before the snake could get to it. You would rely on your superior strength and your power to rescue the helpless mouse. And here's the strategy that you didn't think about to save that mouse. You didn't think about becoming a mouse to save the mouse. And you certainly didn't think about, I'll be the mouse that dies instead. You didn't think about limiting your superior humanity to the space of a weak and frail little mouse. You never said, I'll become a mouse to save the mouse. Yet how did God, Christian, save you? God could have taken out the serpent, the devil, with a word But his plan all along was to rescue us by taking on our weakness. Verse 14, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And that's what makes the incarnation amazing, is the devil's powerful domination over us and what God did to save us. And that leads us to the last point. What makes the incarnation amazing is number three, the son's merciful propitiation. The son's merciful propitiation. Let's finally consider what this passage says about the son. Here is the word become flesh. Verse 14, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. Verse 17, here's the word become flesh. He had to be made like his brethren in all things in regards to their flesh and blood humanity, except sin, of course. So God took on himself that same weakened, frail humanity, yet without sin, which then also made him susceptible to the very thing that we 
greatly fear in our flesh and blood condition. He was susceptible to death. God in Jesus was willing to subject himself to flesh and blood without the sin of it, to live under the weakness of it. He was a helpless babe who needed to be nurtured and fed and protected from a murderous king. He needed to sleep. He grew thirsty and he grew hungry. The eternal second member of the Godhead who had no beginning and who has no end added to his divine being a flesh and blood condition without diminishing anything of his divinity and without adding sin to his being. He added this flesh and blood weakness, this frailty to himself in order to make us his children, his family. Where would you be? Where would you and I be in our frail humanity without Jesus? So here is fuel for your worship, believer. Think on what God has done for you. The the weak and the vulnerable flesh and blood condition you are in. It's a condition that fears death. God took that on in Jesus, in the incarnation. He even made himself in that condition susceptible to Temptation from the devil, right? Verse 18 says that he was, um, he has suffered, he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered. But he did even more than just make himself susceptible to temptation. In robing himself in frail humanity, he suffered. And in robing himself in frail humanity, he boldly and courageously stepped toward that which scares you and me, death. And he got to the grave through the cross. The one so strong, the one who is all-powerful, took a bold and unflinching step of courage into that which terrifies his weak and his frail children. And he did it to save us. We could do nothing. And he did everything. Everything. Do you love the Savior? God didn't come to earth in an untouchable condition. He didn't come and stand far out of the reach of death's cruel touch. In his first coming, in the incarnation, he identified with you and me and your weakness. And he took that weakness upon himself and he tasted death at the cross. Why? Look at verse 17. He had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. In being made like us, he stood as a high priest between us and a holy God. As as our high priest, he made propitiation for us who sinned against a holy God. And here's what that word propitiation is all about. God's wrath was rightly stirred up and it was righteously active against us because of our sin against him. But as a flesh and blood high priest, Jesus at the cross took the blow of God's righteous wrath in our place as a substitute. And in so doing, he satisfied God's justice when he received the wrath that we deserved. As a result, God has no more wrath toward us because in Jesus' flesh and blood condition as a high priest, he died the death 
that we fear, and he died the death we deserved. And so wrath is satisfied. It's propitiated. And so holy wrath can no longer touch the children. Jesus is described in verse 17 as a, as a faithful high priest. Faithful m- makes you look upward. It, it means that he was faithful to God, his Father, and he was faithful to the plan that they had together to save sinners and make them God's children. And in verse 17, as a high priest, he's described as merciful, which looks toward us. And he was merciful towards us because of our pathetic condition. Believers, we are safe now with God because our high priest was faithful to God and merciful to you and to me. Can I just ask you, what are you counting on? What are you counting on to satisfy God's wrath against you? Are you counting on whatever resources you think you have in your flesh and blood condition? That's foolish. There is only one flesh and blood man to look to, and it's Jesus. The God-man. The God-man who was at the cross was was faithful to God at the cross. And the God-man at the cross was merciful to you. And the God-man at the cross was brutal to the devil. Look at verse 14. Through death he rendered powerless him who had the power of death. That one, the devil... He prowls about, he's seeking someone to devour, but he has no power over the believer anymore. Because of Jesus' death in your place, believer, death can no longer usher you into condemnation and into judgment. Instead, death ushers you into the presence of the one you long to see more than anybody. Death lets you see the one you love above all others. And that is freeing for those who believe, but who are still in a weak flesh and blood condition. Verse 15, he did it so that he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Listen, death is not for the believer an evil specter anymore. We don't have to flee it, but we can actually confidently and peacefully face it. Death is not a danger to the believer, but it is a door for the believer. And when it opens, it reveals our Savior's face. He did this for frail children who sinned boldly against Him. He didn't do any of this for the angels, verse 16. The one greater than all the angels looked beyond them to the descendant of Abraham. Flesh and blood desperately need his help, and he gives help. And even when we find ourselves tempted, verse 18, in our weak and vulnerable flesh and blood condition, Jesus gets it. He understands that. He gets us. He understands us in a weak and frail condition being tempted. He walked in our flesh and blood weakness, and he was tempted in his flesh and blood weakness, yet without sin. In fact, he did in that flesh and blood condition something you haven't done yet. He died in it. And he gets you. He understands you. And verse 18 says, he is there to come to your aid in your weakness and in your temptation. So your help is not found in your own resources, believer. You still have flesh and blood. You still have this weak condition. And it is 
bankrupt of giving you any help in the face of temptation and sin. It is weak and it is incapable of holiness and righteousness on its own, with its own resources. It is powerless before death, your flesh and blood condition. So do not turn inward. Do not look within yourself to your own resources you have in your flesh and blood condition when sin and temptation stand before you. You have no resources in your flesh and blood for that fight. All your resources are in Jesus, whom if you turn the page, you'll find that he is now at the throne of grace waiting to hear from you. Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Hebrews 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Believer, in your fight against temptation, persevere in your pleadings to Jesus for help. That's how you find help. That's how you turn away from your flesh and blood weakness is by going to the throne of grace and pleading for his help. Let me address this confidence thing here. Draw near with confidence. Do you feel confident when you pray? You know what? If if his throne was a throne of merit, it'd be tough to be there, wouldn't it? You'd come timidly, You'd be afraid to ask because you know in your flesh and blood condition you haven't earned anything except his anger. And if his throne is a throne of merit, you would not come with confidence. Do you need to remind yourself it's a throne of grace? Because it changes how you would approach him. You don't deserve his help. Your flesh and blood has failed you. It hasn't earned you a right to be heard there. But his flesh and blood did not fail you. His flesh and blood did not fail you at the cross. And his flesh and blood did not fail you in the grave. And he is now at the throne of grace waiting to hear from you in your temptation, in your weakness. And so, since it is not based on your merit, bank on his grace and draw near with confidence to the throne of grace in your pleading for help against temptation. Your help is found there. That's where your resources are. And do you believe what verse 16 says if you come with confidence? Do you believe what it says? Look, so that you may receive mercy. Look, you still need mercy. (laughs) He gave you mercy when he saved you, believer, when you were converted, (laughs) and you need mercy today too. Do you believe this? So that you may receive mercy and so that you may find grace to help? Do you believe you'll find help You see, you're still a believer. You believed at the beginning, but you need to be a believer today that believes stuff like this. Still. Believe what he says. It's a throne of grace. And he gives the help you did not earn, and he gives you the help you do not deserve. Trust him. 
What makes the incarnation so amazing is, number one, the children's fearful condition. Number two, the devil's powerful domination. And thirdly, the son's merciful propitiation. Can I ask you just a couple of questions as we finish? Do you, do you know and do you understand your flesh and blood condition as the Bible describes it? Not the way you view your humanity, but the way the Bible views your humanity. And do you agree with God concerning your frailty in it? Do you agree with God regarding your vulnerability to sin that is within you in that flesh and blood condition? Do you agree with God that you are a sinner? Do you recognize that you are tempted to sin more? Are you afraid to die? Are you still a slave to the fear of death. Listen, until you agree with God on these things about your true condition in flesh and blood, you won't turn to him to save you because you will believe you have a resource someplace else besides him. And there is no other resource besides him. So has Christ truly saved you? Not asking if you go to church, not asking if you read the Bible, not asking if you do religious things, or asking, has Christ accomplished propitiation for you? Has God satisfied his wrath toward you through Jesus? Has he set you free from the fear of death and judgment? The answer is that is, have, have you repented and believed in Jesus Christ? Have you turned away from all that you have made of yourself sinfully so and rebelliously so before God? Have you, have you turned away from that, put your back on it, and faced instead Christ and understanding that what God said he did with his son at the cross, you believe that and you are counting on that more than anything, counting on him, pleading with him, May this be true for me. God, I see this is my only hope. Have you done that? Are you one of these saved, believing children described here in Hebrews 2? In your weakness, you need a Savior. He took on our weakness that he might save us. What an amazing God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, thank you for being our perfect and one and only high priest. Thank you for partaking of our same flesh and blood condition for enduring the cold of night and the hot sun of the day and the insults of man and the cursings and slanders of sinful men. Thank you for in that flesh and blood condition always remaining faithful to your Father, and never sinning in it. And thank you in that flesh and blood condition for dying on a cross when it should have been me, when it should have been us. Well, Father, they, they wrapped that flesh and blood in rags. And that flesh and blood did not could not be touched by corruption. But as David's great son, you burst forth from the grave and now in a resurrected body are at a throne of grace waiting for us, eager to hear from us. What a great God you are. What an amazing thing the incarnation is. And we... <laughs> Come and we adore you this morning. Would you lift up our voices that we might sing with full-throated worship of you?
because of who you are and what you have done for us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.